What's going on, everyone? Welcome to another edition of the Victory Life Legacy Spotlight. I'm your host, owner and founder of Victory Life, Dwight Vick. Um, and today, I have a very special guest, a longtime friend and colleague in the mental health field that uh, you guys know I'm a part of, being an LPC. This is someone I met several years ago. A lot of respect for Sharp as Attack and also a very powerful and passionate woman joining me today. None other than Pelissa Osea Tutu. I appreciate you for jumping on, man. You look great. I can't wait to talk to you today about so many great things you got going on. But welcome to the show. How are you doing? Thank you. I'm doing great. I was able to get a myofascial release before this, so I'm feeling all loose and limber. So I'm ready. you always ready, man. I met you, it feels like eons ago, but... I met you. We were both. I was definitely much younger. I don't even know if my kids were in middle school yet, but I met you. I was already working with uh, Prince William County CSB. Mm -hmm. And then you were coming along and we have a mutual friend, Victoria, um, Vicky, I call her, mm -hmm. chair. Um, and actually, you know, she's we, my cousin. That's right. Yes, <laughs> that's right. She's yeah. your cousin. Yeah. I keep forgetting that. Uh -huh. Diversity personified. Yes. <laughs> well, Ricky is also another sharp clinician. Probably somebody I should get on as well. Yeah. Um, but you and I were doing intensive at home therapy. You were just, I felt like you had like five, six different things you had going on back then. Did. <laughs> in your hours and you were working all over Northern Virginia, DC. Mm -hmm. But um, before we talk about what made you a great clinician, I want to know about where it all started because the unique thing about you, I remember this like it was, I got a crazy memory. I remember meeting you and we we had an instant connection because we were both younger and in the field and you were talking about your whereabouts and where you come from. And you were like, Vic, you got to go take a trip to Ghana. And I was like, Ghana? Of course, Americans, we're so ignorant because the first thing I talked about was Hotel Rwanda. I was like, you know, <laughs> all like, you were like, what are you talking about? No fool. Um <laughs> You you are you you know you're from Ghana and you take pride in that. Yeah. But I not yet have not been there. But there's a plan in the <laughs> works to go. Mm -hmm. But talk about your childhood, your upbringing, maybe because I don't know as much as I would like to know about that. Like where did it all start for you? Well, so actually, I was born in a tiny country inside of South Africa called Lesotho. Um, my, my father had been sent by the Ghanaian government to teach down there. They were trying to promote Pan-Africanism in the 70s. Mm. And so my mom was pregnant with me. And so I happened to be born there. So that's why I'm the only one of my siblings with a South African first name. Okay. Um, so I was born there, but then we moved to the U.S. I was about two and a half. So like the U.S. is definitely home, but ancestrally culturally i am Ghanaian. like i don't have much of a connection to to lesotho but um but yeah so ghana um because of that coming to the us like um i had to adapt to the culture i was told that i didn't talk for the first year because and my dad says yeah he said i think you got confused with languages because um, in Lesotho, they speak one language. My parents were speaking the Ashanti language, Chi, and then I came to the U.S. speaking English, and then I ended up with a babysitter who was Latina, who only spoke Spanish. So <laughs> What? <laughs> yes. So my dad was like, you just were kind of sitting back, and he said, I guess you were trying to decide which language. <laughs> um, so... So ultimately, I speak English, but I understand the Ashanti language. I don't speak it as well. But um, but so, yeah, I grew up in a Ghanaian household and um, first in Arlington. So when we first came to the U.S., um, we lived in Arlington up until I was in the fifth grade. And then after that, we moved to Prince William County, which was like foreign land um, for us. Yeah. Because Arlington is extremely diverse. Yes. And um, so some people know this about me. Some don't. I went to school with Al Gore's children in elementary school. We lived in Southside um, Arlington. But back then, like senators, kids, um, dignitaries, their kids went to public school. So I also see that as part of like part of what has also enriched my life, um, being exposed to like people with money 
as an immigrant who didn't have much. Um, so, so I think that's kind of a, you know, random, random fact about me. Yeah, Um, that is a very random. I had no idea. I've known you forever. I did meet your family at one of your glorious birthday parties. Yes. Uh, my wife and I went uh, and it was a great time. First of all, your family and other close friends got it in. Um, we were dressed yes. nice, but I just sat back and I took it all in. Everyone is so friendly, it dressed. It was just, it was probably one of the more, you know, culturally enriched of program not programs but parties i've been to as far as just it was like just every it was just amazing it was like an experience it just wasn't a party and of course you came in like the queen you are and you took it all <laughs> you took you and your sister yeah. two of the most photogenic photogenic women i've ever met oh thank um, you yeah no absolutely absolutely um but i want to go back to something you talk about um when you got to prince william what which side woodbridge The West Side. Woodbridge. I'm an East Side uh, okay. Woodbridge native. Yes. Let it be known. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, and it was so interesting because the um home we moved into, it was it was a newly built home. Um, so like for my parents, like that was that's the epitome of the immigrant experience is to struggle and then be able to have your own. And so when I was in the fifth grade, we moved out here, brand new house. That was back when calling Arlington was long distance. So I yeah. actually couldn't stay in touch with my friends. We had to write letters to each other. So I'm telling my age. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, <face> down. <laughs> yeah. So it was really, um, that was difficult, um, particularly because the diversity wasn't here. Whereas when I was in Arlington, there was, I had friends who were Ethiopian, Ghanaian, um, Korean, like, Vietnamese, like everybody, Latino. And then I got here and it was, you were either white or you were black. And when I say black, I mean like African-American. There weren't many yes. immigrant um, at black, black folks. And so like that was even a shift being used to that because the first thing I got when I was in Arlington, nobody questioned me about the uniqueness of my name. But um, when I moved here, everybody's like, what name? What is that? How do you say that? And then when I would tell them where I'm from, I would get, oh, but you don't have an accent. And I was like, what? So it's, well, it, it's interesting because I moved to Northern Virginia after I was done um, playing pro ball and chasing mm -hmm. that dream. And in college, my wife was from up here. She was born in D.C., then lived in Palmer Park in Peachy County, then moved to Manassas. When Manassas and Prince William was basically oh. considered very country, it was rural. Um, I mean, it was nothing out there, she said. And I came up here after my career and did, um, you know, the job market. Of course, I got engaged to her. And Prince William was still building up. But to me, being from the 757 Tywood area, all of this was diverse because um, even now, I know what you're mentioning compared to when you first got out there. But even now, like after we're done recording this episode, I got to go out to Dumfries. And the first thing I've been noticing the last three years in Dumfries and in Woodbridge, there are a lot of Africans there now um, that have small businesses. Mm -hmm. So I hear it and I believe you. I know it's true because I've been living in Northern Virginia for 24 years, but I, I can't relate to it because when yeah. I came up here, I kind of saw the migration, so to speak, of more more groups you know moving out further out south i guess mm -hmm. compared to the city like alexandria arlington and dc um when you talk about what high school did you go to i went to garfield i am a mighty mighty um i think we're still the indians but maybe not i think we may have changed um yeah yeah so you went to garfield okay yes. yeah that was different that way yes i went to garfield Um, and also my first job was at Popeye's in Potomac Mills. So I'm It's still there. It is still there. Different location though. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I respectfully, this is a compliment. I cannot see you. <laughs> I'm from Hampton and Newport News, so not to label or judge, but you know, my own girls that work at Popeye's back in the day, uh, you know, I just can't see you. They're just different from you. 
it was it was an experience and um you know you can ask my dad i pushed him i said i need you to come up to the school and sign this um work permit because i want to get a job he's like you don't have to and i was like i want my own money so i had my job at 14 and a half um and i learned very early on that people are very mean when it comes to their food <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, I know. I know. Um, well, and it works both ways if you got TikTok, Instagram or Twitter now X, because every time I look on these crazy fights, my clients show me and see that uh, Waffle House or McDonald's or Popeye's. I never see that stuff pop off at a Chick-fil-A. So, you know, it works both ways with the customers and also sometimes mm -hmm. some of the employees. I don't want to label all. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you, you came from Arlington. And by the way, side note, I remember as you and I started to grow our friendship, you would you you gave me a lot of perspective about being from Arlington because you were telling me as we both grew in our careers, you were saying, you know what's crazy, Vic, is that Arlington, when it comes to license and just mental health practitioners, they cover the spectrum in regards to diversity. And I, you know, I've never worked in Arlington. I know about Arlington because, you know, Arlington and Crystal City and Alexandria are more urban and more city. And, you know, I just went up there just to hang out <laughs> and, you know, go just, you know, sightseeing, shopping, you know, or this, you know, hanging out, social scene. I never looked at it from that way. But that diversity, uh, would you say it really shaped you and your perspective? A hundred percent. And especially because going from um, early years in a very diverse place to going to a place that's less diverse um, I think if you grow up in a less diverse place, your mindset says this is how it's supposed to be. So I was blessed to see what it looks can look like and did look like before seeing the other side. So I think it gave me a perspective on both. So when people are like, oh, no, it's just no, nope. I've seen wealthy people um, live amongst less wealthy people. Mm -hmm. um, when we lived in a one bedroom apartment in Southside. Southside um, Arlington, some of the diplomat, they brought, I had a birthday party at my house, at my apartment, at our apartment, and they brought their kids. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And one bedroom? One bedroom. Oh, man. Yeah. And y'all had a great time. Probably like your birthday party you had that I went to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I've been partying early. Um, it's it's a you know thing in our family to to really celebrate each year as it comes, no matter what's going on, no matter how big or small. So you know, even when my parents didn't have much, they still found a way to celebrate what was coming next for for me and my st siblings. So yeah, interesting. Uh, you and I both come from humble beginnings. I grew up in Newport News, then moved to Hampton. We didn't have much growing up at all. Uh, my mom and dad get mad when I say that. I said, no, I'm not saying I had a bad life. I have a great life, but I did not have Jordans and chains and all those different things, especially during that era when, unfortunately, the crack epidemic hit mm -hmm. and a lot of stuff was going on as far as the community. But with that being said, um, that family of origin I come from, I take pride in being who I am mm -hmm. because my mother is an educator, has a master's, and she's a member of Delta Sigma Theta. My dad is a PhD, and I grew up a preacher's kid. So I grew up playing sports in the church and very active. My sister and I just structure amongst the different things I saw. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about your family of origin, just, you know, because I, I'm, I'm, I'm being dead serious. When I met your family, everybody came up and spoke to me. Yeah. And then they just were so welcoming but I never knew that you came from humble beginnings like me either. Mm -hmm. um, and you yet you persevered. But childhood, you know, growing up, were you challenged, pushed? Were, you, were your parents overprotective? Did they say well, you got to go to college? Um, you couldn't date till when you were whatever age? Like, how was that? You know, let's dive oh, into that, man. <laughs> sure. You know, um, so growing up, you know, when, when we talk about the term African-American, I tell people like, I, I truly embody that. Um, being when I stepped outside of my home, I was American. When I got back into the home, I was African. I was Ghanaian again. And so, um, you know, a lot of I, mom used to make me sit and, and watch her um, cook food. 
and she thought I wasn't interested, but I was paying attention. So now, you know, I can make the best jollof rice and Mm. um, fufu and, and peanut soup in the world. Um, so that was a big thing. Um, I am a nerd. I'm proudly a nerd. Um, so I was the kid who we would get the summer reading list and the teacher said, read one book and I would read the entire uh, book list. I'd be like, mommy, you were, that, you, were, you were that person. I was that person. And let me tell you, uh, that pizza hut down the street from my house knew my name because I was doing the book it challenge and getting those, uh, personal pan pizzas. So again, for the audience who grew up in that era, you guys know what that's about. Um, yeah. And you talking about the one, the pizza near Dell City, the one that's getting ready to No, no, eat. no. This is back when I was in Arlington. So oh, in Arlington. Okay. Young. So then people, yeah. those people in Arlington. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. yeah I, was, I think I, I started reading um, between the age of four, four and five. So mm. I was very, um, very early reader. I loved books. I would escape in books. So like I was in um, sometimes doing advanced courses, even as in elementary school. I started um, violin in the fourth grade and um, got private lessons. Actually, was very fortunate again. Um, my parents didn't have the money, but this uh, African-American um, violinist, she saw something in me and said, no, I want to cultivate it. And she agreed to um, to work with me for free. And nice. also to like living in Arlington again. Arlington has great resources. I'm not a promoter of Arlington or anything like that. I can just speak from my own personal experience. Um, I got to learn how to do computer programming when I was in the third grade. And this is in the 80s because yeah. of the programs that Arlington had back then. So I, I learned how to do use DOS with the green screen and, and all that other stuff. So I just was really enriched. My dad his first degree is in education. So he always, he would throw out big words and I'm like, what does that mean, daddy? And he said, go get the dictionary. Yes. Then, uh -oh. yep. <laughs> yes. So I, I didn't get it. the opportunity to like, he didn't spell it out. I had to sound it out, find it. And then I had to use it um, in a sentence during the week. He said, mm, I want to hear you yeah. use it. So like my vocabulary grew from that. And, um, I was a shy kid, um, pretty quiet. Really? Like, yes, very shy. That's I, probably um, why you're so observant, because you're very observant until you trust that person. Because when I first met you, you kind of laid back in the cut. And you would say hello, but that was it. Yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so yeah. you were you were shy. So you can keep Yes, continue. very shy. And I actually um there was a when I was in elementary school, I got an award for the best thumb sucker. Cause I'll just be sitting there in the corner. <laughs> Just sucking my thumb, watching everything go on, and then I might chime in. So, <laughs> Popeyes and thumb sucker. This is why I love legacy spotlights. <laughs> I would have never. That was a trivia question. True or false? I would have never guessed that you sucked your thumb. That's insane. I know. I, there's probably only like one person that I'm still in contact with who would know that. So, um, but but yeah. So I was quiet. Um, shy tomboyish when I was younger and um enjoyed sports tomboy tomboyish oh you enjoy sports I thought you like tomboys like you fought you fought boys like you know oh I got into football. some fights yeah because people assumed you know I'm five foot about two but people assumed because I was quiet and I was little that I could be you know mm -hmm. knocked around and my mom told me she said you don't let anybody hit you if no. they hit you, you can hit them back. Mm -hmm. um, and so one of the unfortunate realities of my life was I was called, you know, I mean, now people don't think it's a big thing, but African booty scratcher when I was little. Such a crazy term we grew up saying. I, we said that, I think that was nationwide. It was even in the movie, The Boys in the Hood, mm -hmm. when they were going at each other, roasting each other. We said that looking back, that was, first of all, the 80s and 90s, we were not aware of what we were saying. Not From the F all. word to the R word, African booty scratch, it was insane. That's a dumb term looking back, but I, 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 yeah. we said it. Yeah. A lot of people did. And so, you know, somebody said it to me and I went back home and I told my mom and she said, you know what? She's like, but you already walk like a queen. 
Mm. So whatever they're saying to you, it's more about their fear about who you are. And back then it didn't like click. But now, you know, um, when people say to me, you walk in the room like you own it. There's a quiet confidence about you. It, her words always echo in the back of my mind from that conversation. You definitely do. Yeah, shout out to your so, mom and dad for empowering yeah. you. Good God, that's a blessing. Yeah. That's I'm serious, you, especially the work you and I do and have been doing yes. for years. That is so critical. Just that empowerment, man. Mm -hmm. You know, definitely shout out to them. So your sister, it's two of y'all, right? Or is it three? So it's so I have um so I have a total, it's it's a total of five of us. Mm -hmm. Um so two two older brothers, my sister who you've met, who you see in all my yeah. like social yeah. media stuff. And then I have a much younger sister. Um so my uh my oldest brother is 53 um and I lost my brother um my brother passed away 2 years ago um so he's my so I call him my big middle yeah he's the younger big brother um yeah, and then sorry there's about me that. yeah I missed that I'm sorry I didn't know um, that I missed that it, you yeah. know I'm in the, a lot of it's a lot of life stuff going on at the time and so it wasn't something that I really broadcast too much because it was unexpected my brother was 48 at the time when he passed so um mm. so yeah him and then my sister my sister and then my little one who's seven so um <laughs> yeah i know i know <laughs> so so somehow you know my dad has a gen x chai uh two gen xers uh, um, no, three, because the three of us all. Yeah, gen I say three. Yeah. A millennial, <laughs> and then a Gen Alpha. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. you know, I, I I do share your mother's sentiments, man, because um, as I got to know you and see you walking your journey as far as a professional, and just even though uh, we worked together, we became friends. So, you know, you came to my birthday party one time out in DC. And for those watching, when I run this, when Felissa comes in, it doesn't matter if we're talking at the club, a training, just hanging out. She has a presence. So I'm six foot five, ex college and pro football player. Felissa stands there right with me, even though she's shorter. And you came in with a great energy, and I've been around you. So having your mom empower you, you I do agree with her. I share her sentiments that you are yeah. queen like. Yeah. I love that. I think that's why you shine so much. But that childhood shaped you coming yeah. from whole beginnings and you know, coming um, from a different country, you know, here in Arlington, then moving to Prince William, Prince William, excuse me, and making your name for yourself. When did you know, because again, you and I are from a generation where many of us were going to college for the first time. I tell people during that time frame when you were not growing up, you're talking about Martin, hip hop, Tribe Called Quest, yes. uh, TV shows. There was a lot of push, Queen Latifah, for people to get educated, not to say there weren't other things going on, because that was a rough era. But many of us were the first people in our college or second generational wise to go to school, to go get an education. Different World came out, which was a spinoff of the Cosby's, which many people um, were going to college because of those episodes. Right. Allegedly, I think I'm pretty accurate with this. Um, it was a spinoff of the Cosby's and the whole thing. Hillman was supposed to represent Hampton University yes. because it was in Richmond and everything like, and it was South, even though when I watched it, being a VA guy, I'm hearing Whitley talk. I'm like, don't nobody down my way talk like Whitley. No. <laughs> like you missed me with that. We ain't that Southern. Maybe right. Southwest Virginia, where I went to school, Virginia Tech, they talk like that. But not in Arlington, in Northern Virginia, Richmond, or the 757 Tidewood no, area. I did no. not know. But my point is, we were part of a group that college was on the horizon. It was more of us. We led the way compared to now where it's expected, sometimes pushed too much. Um, when did that come from? When did you know? Junior year? Senior? Um, was that like, Melissa, you got to go to school. Like, when, when did that uh, happen? Elementary school. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah, I always knew I was going to college. Well, let me, was, hold on, hold on now, hold on. I know she's like it's about like as the yeah. kids say, you're not capping, are you? Right? You I'm not capping. I, I told you I'm a nerd. 
I, I'm a self-professed nerd, you know, maybe I, I don't wear glasses, so I don't know if that takes away from it, but no, I, um, when I was in elementary school, a cousin went to Princeton University and like, I would hear my mom and dad talk about it and they were like, oh my gosh, he got in there and da, 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 da. And I was like, what's this about? And they were like, oh, he's going to go become a doctor. And so, yes, when I was in like the third grade, I said, I want to go to Princeton and I want to become a pediatrician. And then in Living Color came out and I said, well, I think I want to be a fly girl slash pediatrician. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. The fly girls. Yes. The I kids. said I was going to dance and, and heal kids. Um, but Crazy but, combination, I know. But yeah, no, I since since elementary school, I knew I wanted to go to college. Um, and yeah, so my dad got to go to school. He he went to school on a scholarship in Ghana. Mm -hmm. And when he came to the US, um, here he was with a with a degree, two degrees, and because of the the international laws or whatever, they said, no, your your degree doesn't count. So he had to go back to school. And he was at UDC and um, he was driving a taxi cab. So my dad is this very highly educated man. And this happens with a lot of immigrants. Um, you have doctors um, who are doctors in their countries driving Uber here because their degrees aren't recognized. And so I watched my dad, you know, um, be very humble. Um, my mom didn't have the same opportunity because in Ghana, at the time, high school cost money. And so she didn't get to finish high school. And when she came here to the States, she was able to get her GED and then she became an LPN. So like I saw in real time how these, these people who have shaped me, like they adapted and, um, you know, it was like, of course I'm going to college. So it wasn't even, it wasn't something they had to push, honestly. It was something That's I great. wanted for myself. Yeah, you've always been a go-getter, but I didn't know elementary school is kind of, as a kid, as my son said, he's 18, O.C. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> hey, yo, elementary school, I, I yeah. was playing with Legos and Transformers, as you know, yeah. but it's all good. So you get to college. How do you get to, what school did you choose? I know I have your bio here, but like. I went to VCU. You yeah, okay. Yeah. For yes. undergrad, right? Yes, I went to VCU okay. for undergrad. So what happened was I got older and like, oh, like, oh, it's not that easy to get into Princeton. So um, <laughs> <laughs> so I got a little more realistic. And, and you know, I was in a, I still, you know, I was um, on the first step team in uh, Prince William County. Really? Yes. And I was, I was the second captain they ever had on the step team. So, so hold on. You you said is this Prince William County step team or Garfields? It was Garfields, but I'm saying we created the first step team that ever existed in Prince William County. Hold on, that is I'm going now I got a big that's a big trivial fact. First of all, I'm impressed because I used to do talent shows back in 2013 and 14. Osborne had a step team. OP had a really good one. Um surprisingly, they had a really and I I, I never knew when it kind of originated. Um, and I never, you know, I'm not from here, but I've been living up here 25 years. I never knew Garfield started it. Garfield um, started it. And then like, um, I came on, I came on once they, uh, got it rolling and then took over as a captain. So you kind of did get the fly girl thing going from a living color. Oh you yeah. Cause see? I was, I was the choreographer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, for my for my youngins that's watching this, just YouTube and Living Color. Jim Carrey came from the Wayans Brothers. It was it was a more urban hip hop version of SNL. Yeah, uh, more representation for us, and it was really good. They did numbers, branched a lot of careers. Tommy Davidson yeah. was on there. Living Color was me. And my little sister used to watch them. My family faithfully. Yeah, um, yeah. David a lot of those Allen skits Green. now. Yeah, like, yes, my guy from Boomerang and a, 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 a slew of movies, but. Respectfully, I was talking to some of my guys in, in my group chat, and we share memes and videos, and we talk about everything. If that stuff came out now, again, our generation it canceled. Uh, Handyman guy. and Vera, uh, yes. which is, <laughs> 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 you, I mean, 
it could not come out now. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so you did live, you did get the fly girl thing going with the step team, which is very impressive. Uh, so the, real quick side note, did y'all just step all over the DMV or just, how did that work? I've it always, started you know, off, it started off at pep rallies, black history month, um, mm -hmm. assemblies at school. And then it turned into started having step competitions in Northern Virginia and mm. then the other schools started their own step teams. Yep. And so. That's, yeah. 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 So you enjoyed it. So did y'all ever get recognized? I know now because so many schools, I don't know since COVID, a lot of stuff has changed. But when I was really out in the community with young people, um, I know I knew a lot, quite a few guys and girls that were step teams. I used to travel to like competitions in Virginia and come back with trophies and go against mm -hmm. people from all over other regions of the state and beyond. Same thing for, was it still newer then? It was still very new. So we ended up going to stuff that was like Northern Virginia. Some one time, I think we went to Maryland for something and then something in DC. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, so it was very new, but it was really exciting to be a part of it. And, um, and so, yeah, sometimes there's some people who have said like, I remember you. You know, you guys were on the step team. It was so cool to see it. And I'm like, yeah. And we did not have a coach. We made we made up steps and um just kind of kind of went with it. So thank you for for pointing that out. Like, yes, I did meet my fly girl dream. See? Yes, <laughs> you did. Yeah. So I'm gonna forget because you 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 what did you say? Mindfulness, you're in the moment. You didn't even think about it, but yeah. Um and you used it to benefit you and Garfield, like mm -hmm. you always do. You're very good at multitasking and connecting <laughs> the dots. Um, <laughs> you are. So VCU um, is kind of like Arlington. A lot of people in Northern Virginia, I, I used to have a business that where I did college tours and mm -hmm. you know, people that grew up in Northern Virginia, different depending on where you are, suburban parts, much of a suburban, they look at VCU and ODU, like Norfolk and Richmond. I don't know. It's, Man, yeah. I don't, I want to, yeah, it's kind of hood. Or, and I'm like, nah, VCU, my sister went there. That's a great school. Um, you you go to VCU. Um, how was your time there? And what did you major in? So again, VCU, when it's, when I got there, um, it wasn't the school that people want to go to. Um, it was, like you said, like, oh, Richmond, like, or sometimes I was telling somebody the other day when I said, oh, I'm going to VCU. And they said, oh, is that that school in Charlottesville? I said, that's oh UVA. And no. they're like, so yeah. someone from DC. It, I don't even remember, but I just remember I was so offended, like, no, but, but it was because at the time VCU didn't have a name for itself. And mm -hmm. it was an urban, it is an urban school, but it was very urban. Like now VCU is bought up like most of that yes. strip in Richmond, yes. in downtown. Yeah, yes. But it wasn't like that when I was there. Um, like one of the dorms didn't even have air condition. Yeah. Yeah. VCU <laughs> so. is, is great now. Like a lot of, they got like an engineering department, uh, yeah, medical. Gorgeous. They are really uh, growing. Only thing, my shout out to my VCU people, alumni included, just Please get a football team. That's just me. Because I think, you know, ODU has done wonders for them. I hope they can, because their basketball program is legit. They've been in the Final Four. Great program. Yeah. I love the colors, too. I love the black and yellow, black and gold. Yeah, it's a great color. Um, yeah. yeah. But um, so what did you what did you major in? So I started off pre-med. Yep. I started, because I told you I was going to be a fly girl slash pediatrician. So I start off pre-med and, um, you know, it's the, one of the things that happened was I've always been very smart, but never learned how to study. Man. So I got there my freshman year, just try to sit there in the class and just absorb all the information. And then when it's time to take a, a test, I'm like, why'd I get a C? Why'd I get a D? And um, the reality of like, oh, there's certain aspects of college life you're not really prepared for. And um, and so pre-med biology and chemistry are very different than general ed. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, My mom taught it. Are you kidding me? Yes. Yeah. So Garfield, because you will always value education and not this is nothing against Prince William County Public Schools at Garfield, respectfully. But I've seen this throughout my life as a father, 
and mm-hmm. when I was an undergrad, even in high school, where some of my colleagues and friends peaked in high school academically and struggled in college where I flourished in college because I could focus and I had the resources that taught me how to study where you, I remember meeting this one girl at tech and she was like, I just got AIDS with my eyes closed because I was just naturally smart. I just paid attention, took notes and I just aced the test. Was that your story or is it just because the curriculum was that more intense? Um, no, it was because I, I just was just very smart. And and I think when there's work that involves critical thinking, that's different. But like I got up to uh, calculus, calculus AB in high school and um, and I was taking AP um, biology and chemistry, but I was fine. <laughs> you know, I, I studied, but I still didn't study that hard. And you get to college and it was like, oh, wow. You know, you have this syllabus and they're like, oh, well, the test is going to be on the first 150 pages of this book. And it's like, okay, well, can I skim it? Okay, I remember he said this. And so needing to learn how to take proper notes and, you know, what's relevant. And um, of course, now you know better as you get older, but like you need to like connect with your professor for guidance. Mm -hmm. And mm-hmm. um and unfortunately the VCU classes it was like a lecture with three hundred students and yep. so he's like I'm not raising my hand to ask a question <laughs> and um and we just had gotten email so this was we were still dial up mm-hmm. during that time mm-hmm. so like you know now it's like you can have access to your professors and and all that stuff but. Um, part of it was like, yeah, I just I didn't um, being too smart in high school. Nobody said, oh, we need to show her how to study for college. Yeah. 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 So That ultimately led to you switching your major. So not you- quite. So so freshman year, I went through it and I think it was very important growing pain. Um, but my second semester of my freshman year. Um, probably around, probably like probably around the end of my second semester, um, found out that my mom was sick. Mm. And so, you know, I took a summer school course and, um, I was about to go back to school and it was like, she wasn't being honest about how sick she was. And, um, she basically, she had leukemia and was going to need a bone marrow transplant. And so my, um, the beginning of my sophomore year, like I was bouncing back and forth, forth between Richmond and home. Um, we did like a donor drive because back then, and even now, um, people of color, particularly black folks don't, um, don't do donor, donorship. So it was very (laughs) hard to find a donor and what ultimately happened was, was that um, this is, you know, shout out to Anova Hospital. Um, they went to Ghana and um, they got samples from my mom's siblings. And my mom's youngest sister was like almost her exact match. Wow. And so my um, my second, second semester of my uh, sophomore year, um, my mom had a bone marrow transplant. Um, but like... Here I am, like my my brain wasn't there in school. So I was making it, but I was still struggling because it's like, this is going on. I'm all of 18 at the yep. time. And um, unfortunately, I lost my mom um, February, that February. And I took some, I took the rest of the semester off, but I was like, I'm graduating on time. That was my promise to her. I believed I had prayed on it. And I was like, I know like that is not what she wanted for me and my life. And, um, but I was also like, I don't know if this is, do I really want to do this? Like, do I want to be a doctor? Or is it because I said it since I was so young? And um, that's where my exploration about what else was there. And um, I volunteered with blood donor services Um, you know, after my mom passed away and was like, well, actually clinical working with blood types and all that other stuff. And like, 
oh, could I, could that be what I'm supposed to do? Help people um, who need transplants and things like that. So I volunteered with them for a little bit. And so I switched my major to clinical sciences. Um, and then I got to organic chem two. And I said, oh, no, 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 I don't do this for me because this is a painful class. This is really painful. Um, but at the same time, I was taking a lot of psychology courses. And as I was taking them, I said, maybe I should make this my minor. And I ended up um, like, I was just like, no, I love psychology. Like, this is something, it just comes so naturally. And then I said, oh, let me take um, anatomy of the brain. Mm. And since v VC is a teaching hospital, I got to see a whole human brain and like, you know, we were, they opened it up and we got to look at it. And I knew I I could, with my eyes closed, like, this is the cerebellum. This is where this is. This is where that is. Yeah. And, um, and then I called my dad and, um, you know, I said, daddy, I don't, I don't want to go to medical school. I think I want to get my degree in psychology. <laughs> and he said, are you on drugs? <laughs> and because the real, that's a natural reaction. Absolutely. Because his child had been saying since the third grade that she was going to become a pediatrician. And I was so far along in, in my college career. And it's just like, what? And I'm sure reflecting now, my, I'm sure him as a dad it had been less than two years since my mom had died. And so for him, he's probably like, oh my gosh, like I failed. And um, and so he he said to me, you know, well, what's your plan? You have to tell me your plan. And so I went to met with the advisor and I said, what do I have to do to still graduate on time? Um, and they said, you're gonna have to do 24 credits per semester. Um to, to get through. Whoa. At 24? Yeah. So basically they count. So uh, VCU has this winter session. So she counted that as a full. And so it was like, I said, okay. And I ended up on the Dean's list for the rest of my, um my last two years at VCU. And Man. I went, wow. And I went home, um, Every every other weekend, or my sister, who was thirteen at the time, would come and stay with me for the weekend. Twenty four credits a semester. Yeah, and you remained on the dean's list, and you worked. Mm -hmm. My God, you are amazing, man! I, look, first of all, I think the most I ever took a couple of times in undergrad was eighteen, and I always felt like I was going to miss a class or assignment. Because that was during, the, I only did it during the spring semesters because we didn't have practice like that. But I didn't work and I definitely enjoyed myself. So did you ever have any time to get it in as far as partying? and All the time. <laughs> so, well, you need to lead a train, you need to lead a training on, after we record this on work-life balance. Because the fact that you were able to take, yeah, I'm just saying, I mean, you you did it. Well, maybe that was different back then, but 24, yeah. come on, anybody watch whether you went to college or not. So the average student, for those who don't know, 12 credits is the baseline. You have to be a full-time yeah. student, four classes. Some people do 15, which is five. 24, you do the math. That's crazy. Yeah, wow. basically That's I had to crazy. cram four years into uh, two, into two years. Yeah. Mm -mm -mm. Well, you did it, you know? I, I did. I did. And then my dad said, and then what? Um, yeah. And I said, oh. Maybe do the Peace Corps or Teach for America. And he's like, What? He said, You need a plan. He said, You can't do anything with just a psychology degree. No offense. No. No. And and so he said, What's your plan? And um, so I went and saw a uh a vocational counselor at VCU. And um, if I could see him today, I would give him a big hug. Um, his name was Dr. Napoleon, but he was six foot five. Funniest thing ever. Wow. Yeah, six foot five. And he had both his MSW and his a PhD in clinical psychology. Oh, balling. 
And wow. he had made me do an assessment before I met with him. And so when he called my name, he said, hello, Miss Social Worker. And I said, uh -uh. <laughs> I said, no. And he said, yeah, absolutely. And so that was back in 2001. And he told me, he said, everything about who you are based off of this assessment and the family you come from, it makes 100% sense why yeah. our social work is right for you. And I was like, yeah. huh. And he gave me this book that um, showed the perspective um, jobs in the field of social work, um, the salary, projected salary over the next 20 years. Mm -hmm. and, um, and he said, I really want you to think about it. And, and then I spoke to a couple of my psychology professors and I said, what do you think? Because I think I want to do my master's in counseling. And they all told me, no, go social work. Yeah. 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 Well, you you did that. I mean, you got your master's. You got one master's, right? I thought it was Just two. one master's. I went to the illustrious Howard U um, oh, for grad The real school. HU. The real yeah. HU, yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, and and it was an amazing program. I um I appreciate going to a predominantly white school for my undergrad experience, and then going to a predominantly um, historically black university for my grad school uh, program. It was smaller. It was more mm -hmm. intimate, and like your professors knew who you were. Like if yep. I was having a bad day and I walked in, um, you know, I had a professor. He was like, "Go home," and I was like, "But I still have." No, you're no good to us today. We will get you the information. Class, y'all got Pelissa? Yep. Go home. Nice. Nice. Yeah. My mom taught at Norfolk State and Hampton University for years, for decades. She got her okay. undergrad and master's from Hampton back when it was Hampton Institute. And then it became oh, HU, wow. other HU. I'm not part of that debate, y'all watching. I'm not, I'm not <laughs> I doing know, that. you better be careful. Don't jump in them comments talking about, <laughs> this ain't that kind of legacy spotlight. Save that for a Facebook thread. But um, yeah, man, and I grew up around the H HBCU campuses, uh, Hampton and Norfolk State, because my dad went there for undergrad. And I know exactly what you're talking about. Obviously, I didn't go there for undergrad or graduate degree, but I grew up at, on those campuses. And I know exactly what you're talking about. My mom was that way with her students. Um, she taught pre-med. She's a biology major. So um, she taught pre-med, which is why when I looked at you, I was like, man, because I remember around the house, all those books, she still got them right now, man. Them books was thick just back in the day. I mean, and the different things. But let's let's speed up some. Let's get to, yeah, yeah. like, the current part. Oh, yeah. Like, so you, you get your master's from Howard. Shout out to Howard. I just did a college tour there yeah, last school year. Great campus. Um, and then eventually become licensed, which to be an LCSW. Mm -hmm. So you have what I have, the LPC, the LCSW, and the LMFT, Licensed and Managed Family Therapist. Mm -hmm. But the LCSW, I have a lot of colleagues that it took them a couple of times to pass that test. Mm -hmm. And the LCSW, to be your experience, to have that, um, and then to be a woman of color, yes. is pretty illustrious. It's pretty special. I'm not going to mix words. Like you put yourself in a very unique, unique category. Um, does it hit you? I, we we're going to just dive into your professional stuff here in a second. But okay. you know, you're still thriving. You still have a lot of big plans on the horizon. A lot of big plans, but. You know, thinking about coming from humble beginnings and to have that license, that puts you in a room when you have a license where very few people can do, not just the diagnosing and the assessing, but you are considered pretty much an expert in your field. Absolutely. Um, how, how do you, I mean, does it like, yo, do you ever be driving around like, you know, on a Tuesday afternoon, like, yo, I'm licensed. <laughs> some people, some people will throw that in your face. Like them people that get saved at church and then after six months, I'm a Christian. You know, I'm a Christian, right? You better believe it. I don't eat that no more. I'm a Christian. <laughs> <laughs> do you do that with your license or is it more so like, man, like I'm, I'm really doing it. Um, you know, just take a moment to exhale a little bit. Yeah. It's a it is a com culmination of a lot of hard work. Um, I didn't get my license until I was 10 years in the field. Mm -hmm. And part of it was it's, it was a very hard road, you know, in getting licensed, yes. like how hard it is sometimes to get the 
clinical supervisor stick with them. And, um, and so it wasn't that I had a hard time passing the exam. It was having someone and it being encouraged because back then it wasn't pushed in the state of Virginia the way it is in Maryland and DC. Yes. So yeah, I, I worked in the field for 10 years before I got it. Um, but I'm glad I did because I was truly prepared for it. And so then when I got my two years post, um, Matt, um, post LCSW, I became a clinical supervisor. And so I was already poised to like support others. And so that's what I've been doing now for the last uh, almost 12 years is providing clinical supervision to the up and coming social workers. And so, no, I don't throw it in anybody's face, but you know, it's, it is a distinction. It is an honor. Um, and the statistics came out last year that um, black social workers fail the the clinical exam at a rate of 68% um, mm. higher than any other uh, cultural group. Um, and then under that is black men. And so, yeah, to hear that um, is like, wow. Um, and then on top of that, they said, if you take the exam after the age of 28, your uh, risk of failing the exam is even higher. And I definitely was older than 28 yeah. when I took the yeah. exam. Yeah, why so, is that? Are you just, I, I guess you really can't answer. I don't know, what, that's, you hit, that's I can wild. I can't answer it. Okay. Um, you know, it's because a lot of black social workers end up in crisis oriented jobs. Intensive in home, that's how, you know, we both have done it. You don't get to like focus on your clinical skills. You're putting out fires and then you're bouncing from one place to the other. You don't get to sit down and say, oh, I just used uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, you know, and da, 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 da. No, you're just like Johnny was tripping and I had to like make sure the mom didn't throw whatever at him during my session. And you get typecasted. Because yes, it's hard. You and I are in a female dominated profession. So anytime I came in the room, like, oh my goodness, a black male, but they kept giving me all, all I got were ADHD and oppositional defiant kids. Yeah. So thank God, shout out to Bessie Stroderman, yes. um, who was our supervisor, and she gave me direct uh supervision for my practicum That's where amazing. I did at Prince William. And she was like the Yoda. She taught me so much. And she's also like a mentor. We had a personal relationship. Like she was like a, I don't even want to say a motherly figure because it was just, we had a bond and she gave me cases that were different from what everyone else gave me. I was able to work with kids, girls who were engaging in self-injurious behavior. She also supervised me when I was doing family therapy the mm -hmm. right way. Not like, you know, the stepdad got up and went out and I was with him. It was like real family therapy. Yeah. She coached me. So you're right about that, putting out crisis stuff. That is, you get typecast and you get locked in and it's like, well, why bother? Yeah. So would you say, would you encourage more people? Um, not just people, but we're talking about women and men of color to get that license. What is the benefit and would you encourage them to do so? Uh, not just the money, but just the benefit. Yeah, the, the independence, one. Um, two, the other piece of it is... Um, so independence, autonomy, and also to it allows you to be the type of social worker you want to be. Um, when you're when you aren't licensed, you're there's a certain place you get stuck in, and um, and so once you are licensed, you're allowed to move a little more freely. You're allowed to start your own business and focus on a certain population. Um, and then also too, once you're licensed. Um, there's a different level of respect for your craft. Yeah. And like, let's be honest, would you work with a doctor who didn't pass their boards? Mm -mm. No, not at all. Yeah, Not even, I'm leaving. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So it also demonstrates like competency. And so that's why, you know, um, you know, jumping into what I'm doing now, um, I am a part of two, two programs that are helping to get um, clinicians licensed in the state of Virginia. And one program focuses specifically on people of color. 
And, um, and so I've been very fortunate, very blessed to be a, a support for those folks on that journey. And so I have um, supervisees from Asia, Africa, um, South America, the U.S., like, um, so with Africa, I have East Africa, I have West Africa, um, moving more towards Central. And so it's really exciting um, because the piece is like the cultural competency piece, because um, there's just a way to care for um, folks who are training to become social workers, to become licensed, because I also do consultation for licensed providers, because, um, you know, you and I have talked about it. I'm very passionate about mental health, but I'm especially passionate about um, mental health when it comes to Black men. Yes, and, um, there's, there's this um, There's this thing that happens where when a Black man finally decides to come in for therapy, a lot of times, my wife said, if I don't come, she's going to leave me. Um, I'm going to, my. I got into a fight at my job. And if I don't do this, like, I'm going to lose my job. I can't lose my job. So a lot of times the reason why they're here is out of reluctance and they're forced. And so it takes a lot more to get them to stay because it's like, I'm checking off a box. And so sometimes part of the work I've done with my supervisees is around creating a safe space for black men, because it's the, we don't want it to be, that's the only reason why they're coming for counseling. And I've, I've even one time, this one gentleman during COVID, he was having a hard time with his computer, phone, and he was ready to give up. And I said, Mr. Black man, I want you here. I do not want this to be the reason why you don't come back. Mm. So you tell me, what do you think you are going to need for us to be able to work this out for you to get this intake um, done? And we talked it out and he showed up um, for the next appointment. And I think sometimes that's what it is, is just um, people need to stop fearing Black men. People need to stop seeing their pain as just anger and needing to meet them where they are. And um, and the other side of it is getting more Black men like you in the field, um, because there is something to be said about um, someone looking like you and being able to talk to you about your stuff. There's just, there's yes. a difference. Nothing to take away um, from any of my my colleagues who who are of different races and ethnicities, but sometimes there's just this safety, and um, and so that's the other reason why I I do want to support this um, initiative for this state, and also too, it's not just for for the country because we are moving towards that compact to where you can um, practice across state um, state lines. Um, yeah, so. I cannot wait for that either. Yeah, I'm waiting. I'm again. I I can't tell you enough, Alyssa, man. Um, you're doing it, and I love what you're doing it because you're making a difference. A lot of people, I laugh. I had this conversation with um one of my longtime female friends from high school the other day, and I told her I was getting ready to go live, and she said, "Okay, Vic, I can sense you because I'm very passionate. I live with passion and purpose." Mm -hmm. And she was like, "Why were you? Why are you going to go live?" I said. Because I'm tired of everybody talking and posting, but not enough doing. I said, everybody can tell you what's wrong with the world, whether, whether regardless of the political affiliation or what needs to be done. But when it's time to donate money, when it's time to donate time and to, uh, to help the youth, the families, to empower people, it's just more so rhetoric. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm saying you're doing it. I'm not saying it because we're recording this episode and you and our longtime friends and colleagues. I'm seeing the work when you post. I'm seeing it done. I'm hearing about it. I know there's a lot more to come. And that's why I wanted to showcase you. Uh, just really quick, just to, really literally, just two more questions and we got to wrap mm -hmm. up. But, you know, when you hear about all the great things God has blessed you with and you went out and, and you made it happen for yourself, you've overcome adversity. Many times there's a story. Everyone knows who I'm related to. My cousin, Mike Vick, he's an icon, a polarizing figure. Mm -hmm. And his story is unique because he's overcome a lot. But there are many people like me and you, and I call you what I what I call you a superhero. And I, I did a speaking engagement in Newport News DSS in front of uh, over 400 people in Newport News back in February. 
very proud. And the message I said is you are all superheroes. Yes. And I and they were looking, I'm like, let me break it down. Basically, because they're the ones that go into the homes with a bag, a manila folder, a laptop, a cell phone, and no weapons, maybe some pepper spray or mace, but they got to go in and de-escalate, mm-hmm. assess. Sometimes you go in homes where there's bed bugs, roaches. Yes. Um, there were shootings. Some of these neighborhoods are not the safe. Even in some of these communities where it's very affluent, you might go into a home where there's a, uh, someone with a severe mental health disorder, schizophrenic, mm-hmm. or someone that's off their meds. You can hear them screaming as you park the car. And we go in and stabilize. Yes. So to me, Pelissa, you are a superhero. Yeah. And you. yet, like my cousin and even myself, there's a story. And again, we we don't want to, maybe there's a part two coming because we never have enough time when I do these. But with that being said, your legacy is still not done. But yet you have one, the fact that you are doing a lot of great things. But yet it didn't come without challenges. Just really quickly, being a black female, a licensed clinician in the D.C., Northern Virginia, Maryland area, what did you have to overcome? Did, did you get people that were passive aggressive, microaggression, macroaggression, oh, where there were people that didn't tell you what you needed to do, like try to block your blessing, as my old folks say? Uh, mm-hmm. What? How did that go? Because did you, you didn't wake up elementary school, grade, honor roll, pop. <laughs> it, there's, 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 you know, God bless your mom. That was some adversity, but I'm talking about professionally. Does that make sense? Of course. I, oh my gosh. There's there's so many to be Condense, honest. To I'm trying to I'm trying to think, you know, that definitely the the microaggressions have been um have always existed for me. Um of course one of the bigger challenges was, you know, I, I came out of I went straight from undergrad to grad school. So when I got in the field, I was only um 24. And um, one of the, I experienced a lot of ageism from the older women who, you know, kind of minimized my abilities and, um, you know, tried to give me their like leftover work. And some of them didn't really like prepare me for the field and um, sometimes put me in dangerous situations because they seemed to be, they were scared about me maybe one day coming and taking their job. So I found myself having to protect myself very early on. And I hear that a lot with um, Black women who are kind of moving up in the fields where they have this armor on because it's like, can I trust them? Can I trust them? And um, and then for me, you know, I got to the point where it was actually easier for me to have a male supervisor, I found, than having a female supervisor. And it was weird for me because as a Ghanaian woman, like, our reverence for our elders, it's like, oh, that's an auntie. Like she's going to come to me with so much support and wisdom. And I wasn't getting that. And then sometimes um, I think because I was in spaces for years where I was the only black face, I wasn't as intimidated being in those um, settings because Mm -hmm. I got it so early on. But then I realized I was like, oh, is this what's happening where I would see like if it was two of us, us be pitted against each other and one person taking the, the bait and the other not. And I never took the bait because I'm yeah. like, you're not my competition. Mm-hmm. And um, and so, you know, I, I don't know how to tell a story without like revealing a place that I worked, but I really did. You I can tell it. You, can see, you can say it. We ain't getting sued. <laughs> this is your legacy, your narrative and truth. I mean, you know, I'll I'll give you an example. I was working somewhere and, you know, I would take my trips to Ghana and um, Christmas has always been a very important time of the year for Ghanaians. And now Americans have found out because now they're all going for Christmas. And Mm -hmm. I specifically had asked for this time. At the time I was only, I didn't have money. So I was able to go to Ghana like every other year. One living grandparent, she's in Ghana, and my um, my mother is buried in Ghana. And I I asked for the time off to go. I had an entire plan for my caseload um, and spoke with my supervisor and my, my colleagues on coverage. And I had all of that ready before I presented um, my leave request. And the response I got back was, um, 
Well, it, I don't think it was meant to get to me, but they said, um, why can't she ask for the time off um, in the summertime like everybody else? Mm. And I was like, wow. <laughs> and um, and I knew it wasn't supposed to get to me. And I was upset. And I, I let my supervisor know and the program manager know how upset I was. And I said, and an email is following because this is this is a perfect example of someone lacking cultural competency in a field that requires a lot of cultural competency, empathy, and thoughtfulness. And in my email, I I said, whereas you can get in your car and go visit your grandma, your nieces, nephews, whomever, I have to spend over $3,000 to look my grandmother in the face for a week or two, if I'm lucky. Speak on it, absolutely. And, and so I said, how dare you basically um, say, why doesn't she ask for it like everybody else? I'm not everybody else. My name is Pelissa, A period, Osei And I am Ghanaian. And that's where my family is. Man. And, um, yes. And uh, I didn't, I never got a response back, but those other two folks in leadership, they knew I was sending it and they, they were proud. They liked it, but they didn't want to admit it. Um, but they also like, I guess they defended me and specifically. As they should. Yeah, because it was my leave. And, but I definitely knew nobody else um, got something like that. And I did leave shortly after. Um, yeah, but but yeah, and so I, I share that story with my supervisees, um, and even my decision to quit um, my salaried position two years ago to start my own business. Um, sometimes we have to take that leap of faith, and oh. when you have supports in your life, or when you truly believe in yourself and where you're supposed to go, and and that your your path has been laid out, even if it's like. There's some alligators trying to chomp at your feet as you're running. Um, you're supposed to do it. And that's, no doubt. that's where I am. No doubt. Well, you kind of answered the second part of the question because I was going to ask you what those life lessons taught you, but you just summed it up right there, which is well said because you've done that. I'm just so proud of you. I'm honored to call you a colleague and friend. What's the name of your practice and where can everybody find you, whether it's for supervision, consultation, how can I get in for trainings? You lead trainings. You just did a great one in D.C. Um, where can they find you? Um, name uh, so, your practice. Sure. So my my practice is called Sit a While and Heal um, LLC. And I'm virtual only. And uh, my website is uh, www.sit-awhile.com. Um, no doubt. So you can reach me that way. And I have an Instagram um, and that's sit a while, sit a while dot heal dot mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. And before I sign off, do you want to give a tease or speak on this major thing you're working or we're going to hold? I mean, so I we can do a little tease. Go ahead. Just okay. because because for okay. everybody watching this again, I talked to her about three weeks ago and this this I don't even want to mess it up, but this is going to be okay. special. The, the beginning of something I'm going to be honored to be a part of and support, but yeah. just, you know, give a little season to go ahead. Go ahead. Yes. Okay. So, um, so as a healer and someone who loves to travel and someone who wants to bring my homeland to the world, um, I have decided that it's time to uh, put together a black men's healing retreat to Ghana. And, um, and I asked um, Dwight Vick, if he could um, join and support um, whomever wants to come on this journey it is going to be a place for men to be free, to um, maybe find their tribe if they don't have one, um, to maybe heal from something that they haven't, or to like renew where you already are. Like, because sometimes our story can be healing for someone else. And in Ghana, we have the slave castles, which are unfortunate reminder of um, what Black people have endured. Um, but then also, to the other side of it is how we've been able to come come um, 
come full circle. And so want to be able to do that with a healing um, ceremony, naming ceremony, and then just touching down on the continent. So I'm really excited I'm shooting for September 2025. So please look out for information. And I'm so excited that um, Dwight's going to join us. Um, I, I already Her know. One too. <laughs> I know. I know. I thought about that. So well, That's all good. That's bigger than that. I need that. It's going to be good for me as a clinician and practitioner as well as a man. I am yeah. so excited about that. I'm honored that you thought of me because you have a lot of esteemed colleagues. So I'm yeah. and I'm very respectful and honored to be a part of that, man. And I'm very excited that you were able to join us and record this great episode. Felissa, yes. I can't I speak for so many people. You are remarkable. You are class personified and you are a queen. Um, and you're only getting started. Shout out to your lovely sister as well, your twin. Sometimes I look at the picture, I'm like, okay, that's Melissa. Yes. Um, it's crazy, man. And shout out to your family. Um, they've done a great job supporting you, your village, and your other colleagues that you collaborate with and your practice. It's just shining a great light in Northern Virginia and throughout the DMV that we need. So I appreciate you being part of the solution and not the blame and the problem. We need more solutions. And I appreciate you jumping on, man. And again, for everybody watching, thank you for joining the Victory Life Movement. Please support Pelissa and her movement, her business, her practice. I guarantee you, and I don't make many guarantees, you will not be disappointed. If you can get it for a training consultation, she will improve your practice as well. I'm not being paid to say that. I don't say anything I don't mean. And with that being said, I thank you guys for joining us today. Make sure you subscribe to my channel. You see great interviews and legacy spots like this. And like I say, every episode, no matter where you go, no matter what you do, make sure you have a positive impact and you leave a great legacy. I'm Dwight Vick, owner and founder of Victory Life. Thank you, Pelissa. Everyone take care. Yeah. Bye.